So question next is asking, describe how a solid sample of lead to chloride can be prepared using the following reagents. So how can we prepare lead to chloride using the following reagents? So the first reagent we have been given, we have been given dilute nitric acid. Apart from dilute nitric acid, the second one we have been given is dilute hydrochloric acid. And then lastly, we have been given lead to carbonate. So we have these three things, dilute nitric acid, we have dilute hydrochloric acid, and then finally we have lead to carbonate. So we have been told to prepare lead to chloride. So for this question, this question is testing on an aspect in form 2, which is the topic of salts, preparation of salts. And for this preparation of salts, the most important thing we should know in this question is, we should know uh, which salts are soluble, which salts are not soluble. So for this question, first of all, we can know that all salts of potassium, sodium, and ammonium are soluble. So if you know that, you are good to go. So all salts of sodium, potassium, and ammonium are soluble. And apart from that, we can also see that all nitrates are soluble. So if you have any nitrate, we have been told to react any nitrate or check any solubility of any nitrate, we should know that all nitrates are soluble. Apart from that, the easier, uh, like the other easier one, it's about carbonates. We see that all carbonates are insoluble. So all of them, be it what carbonate or what carbonate, except the carbonates that belong to potassium, sodium, and ammonium. Because the first set of information, remember, we have said that all salts of potassium, sodium, and ammonium are soluble. So all salts of these three are soluble. So for the carbonates, remember, all the other carbonates are insoluble except the carbonates of potassium, sodium, and ammonium. So those ones are soluble, but apart from that, all the other carbonates are insoluble. So like a, apart from that, you can also see that all, sul, all sulfates are soluble except barium sulfate and lead sulfate. So all the other sulfates are soluble except the sulfates of barium and the sulfates of lead. Then finally, we can look at chlorides and say that all chlorides are soluble except silver chloride and lead to chloride. So for the lead to chloride, we see that the lead to chloride is only soluble in hot or warm water. But in cold water, lead to chloride is insoluble. So in this case, remember we have been given, we need to prepare lead to chloride, beginning with dilute hydrochloric acid, then we have dilute nitric acid, and then lead to carbonate. So remember, uh, the first acid we have been given is dilute nitric acid. So nitric acid contains the nitrates that we need. So the first bit of information that we are going to do here, so we are going to add excess lead to carbonate to dilute nitric acid in a beaker. So you must add excess. If you omit the word add excess, you are going to get it wrong. So you must add excess. So that's why the first information we are saying, add excess lead to carbonate to dilute nitric acid in a beaker. So you take the nitric acid, we add lead to carbonate. So after doing that, the next step will now be filtration. So you should filter in order to obtain the filtrate. So this filtrate, remember, it's now the nitric acid having reacted with the, with the lead to carbonate. So you filter in order to obtain the lead to carbonate residue and the filtrate that we need. So apart from that, now the next step is now we add dilute hydrochloric acid to the filtrate that was obtained. So we add dilute hydrochloric acid. So remember, when we reacted now the lead to, lead to carbonate with nitric acid, so we're going to get now the products. So for these products we're going to get, we are now going to add now the dilute hydrochloric acid. So if you add this dilute hydrochloric acid, so we're going now to get now the lead to chloride that we need. And then remember the question is also asking uh, how can we be able to obtain the lead to chloride. So the last step is again filtration. So we're going to filter off the residue that is going to be formed. So after filtering off the residue that's going to be formed, so we're going to wash and dry now the lead to chloride that will have been formed. And then that is it. But how do you dry this lead to carbonate that was formed? So you dry this lead to carbonate between filter papers. You should never heat the lead to chloride. Sorry, the lead to chloride. You should never fill, uh, heat the lead to chloride that is formed, but you should heat to dry. But you should only dry this lead to carbonate between filter papers, and that is what the question is asking. 
So that is how you prepare these salts. You should prepare these salts and any other question you can be asked about these salts. You should prepare them by considering solubility of salts. If you consider solubility of salts, you are good to go in this preparation of the different salts that you may be asked in any exam. So going to the next question, the next question is asking, a certain element A whose atomic number is 14 has three isotopes. So the table below shows the mass number and the relative abundance of each isotope. And if you can look at the table, so this is the table that we have. So for this table, you can see that the first isotopic mass we have been given, we have been told, we have 28 having an abundance of 92.2. So apart from that, the next one is 29 having an abundance of 4.7 and then the other one is 30. So the question is now asking, calculate the relative atomic mass of element A. So what is the relative atomic mass of the element A? So for you to find the relative atomic mass of such a direct question, what you should do is that you take the percentage abundance, you multiply by the isotopic mass given divided by the total abundance. In this case, it is 100. Because if you add the, the percentage abundance, all of them, you're going to get that we should be having 100%. So what you do in calculating the relative atomic mass, remember, you take the percentage abundance you have been given for that specific element first. You take the percentage abundance, you multiply by the isotopic mass, divide by 100. So this answer you are going to get here, you are going to add it to the next, uh, to the next calculation. So in the next one you are going to say also we have 29 times 4.7, then you divide by 100 and then the other one. So if you calculate this thing correctly, you are going to get 2,810 divided by 100. So if you take this 2,810 divided by 100, you are going to get that the relative atomic mass in this case is 28.108. And that is how to calculate the relative atomic mass in this case. But what if you have been asked to define now a relative atomic mass? So for the definition of relative atomic mass, remember, you can say that the relative atomic mass of any element is the mass of any, uh, of any element or atom compared to that 1 over 12 or carbon negative 12. That is the definition of relative atomic mass. It is the mass of any element compared to 1 over 12, that one of carbon atom. So that is the full definition of relative atomic mass. And in this case, in calculating our relative atomic mass, we have gotten our answer to be 28.108 and that is the answer in our case so the next question it's asking some potassium chloride was contaminated with copper 2 oxide describe an experiment to show how the potassium chloride can be obtained from the mixture so how can you be obtained how can we be able to obtain potassium chloride from a mixture of now the potassium uh, the potassium chloride with copper 2 oxide. So how can you be, be able to obtain uh, the potassium chloride and separate it from copper 2 oxide? This is simple because this question is also testing on the solubility of salts. So if you can be able to remember about the solubility of salts, you are good to go. Because remember in solubility of salts we say that all potassium, sodium and yeah, potassium, sodium and ammonium salts are soluble. So in this case, the first thing we are going to do is that we are going to add water to the mixture in order to dissolve the potassium chloride because potassium chloride is soluble. Calcium oxide is insoluble in water. So since potassium chloride is soluble, so we are going to add water in that mixture. If we add water in that mixture, this water is going to dissolve all the potassium chloride available in the mixture. So if all the potassium chloride will be dissolved, it will mean that the copper 2 oxide which is going to remain, or the copper 2 oxide is going to remain as a solid residue. So if this happens, we are now going to go to the next step, which is now filtration. So the next step is now filter in order to remove the residue of copper 2 oxide. Because the potassium chloride is going to be a filtrate, while it's going to be collected as the filtrate, while the copper 2 oxide will be collected as now the undissolved solid residue. So apart from that now, we'll have obtained now the copper 2 oxide candle, now, now the potassium chloride solution on the other side. So now how to obtain now the solid potassium chloride, we are going to evaporate the mixture. If we evaporate the mixture, 
water is going to escape and then we are only going to remain with potassium chloride in the beaker where the heating process was taking place. And that is how to separate a mixture between potassium chloride and calcium and copper 2 oxide. And then you are done with that. So question number four, it's about uh, electrical charges, which we studied in form two. So for this question, we can see the question is asking, the, the following diagram shows the effect of electric current on lead to chloride, whereby we have electricity, which is passing in solid lead to chloride. Because remember, we have not been told that this lead to chloride is aqueous. It is still in solid form. And then remember, for ionic compounds, they do not conduct electricity in solid form. However, they only conduct electricity in aqueous form and not in solid form. So in this case, we, are, uh, we can see that the lead to chloride which is being used in this experiment is in solid form. So since it is in solid form, it is not going to transmit any electricity because it does not have any mobile ions. So the ions are still intact and not solid. For the only compounds, remember we say that they only conduct electricity in aqueous or in liquid state, but not in solid state. So the first part A of this question is asking, when the current was let to flow in this, uh, in this experiment, nothing happened. So the current did not flow. So why did, did the current be able to flow in this experiment? So the, the current was not able to flow in this experiment because we see that solid lead to chloride does not, con, uh, does not have mobile ions. So since it doesn't have any mobile ions, this will mean that no electricity could be able to pass from the anode towards the cathode because the electric current travels from the positive electrode to the negative electrode. So since there are no mobile ions, so electricity was not able to flow between now the anode and the cathode. So there will be no observable change in this experiment. So part B of the question is asking, when lead to chloride was heated to about 300 degrees Celsius, it melted and there was light on the bulb. State and explain the observation made. So in this, in this case, we have been told that the lead to chloride was then heated to melt. So after melting, it formed a liquid. Because remember the three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas. If you heat solids, they are going to change to liquid form. Now, since the lead to chloride was now in liquid form, it now had mobile ions. And then remember, previously we said that these mobile ions are responsible for transporting or transmitting, not transmitting, they are responsible for conducting electricity from the anode towards the cathode. So these mobile ions are now inside now the lead to chloride, which is now in liquid form. So this will mean that since the lead to chloride was heated, it now had mobile ions. And these mobile ions were now responsible for conducting electricity from the anode to the cathode, which resulted to the bulb lighting. And that is now the answer for that question. But what if you have been asked about now the equation at the anode and the equation at the cathode? So for the equation at the anode, remember the anode is the positively charged electrode, while the cathode is the negatively charged electrode. So for the equation in the, in the anode, we have chlorine, which is losing electrons, and then we are getting chlorine gas plus two electrons. While the equation at the cathode, we see that the lead is gaining two electrons in, in order to get now the lead that we have. As you can look at that equation, this is now the equation at the cathode and the equation at the anode, which summarizes now this experiment in this question. So let's look at the next question, which is asking. The equation below shows a reaction between a thin and bromine. So if you can look at this, at this uh, diagram, you can see that we have an alkene reacting with a bromine. So it can be halogenation or it can be an additional reaction. So the part A of the question is asking, state with the reason whether this reaction is an additional reaction or a substitution reaction. So for this reaction, we can see that this reaction is indeed an additional reaction because, so you can see that bromine has been able to break the double bond. So if the double bond has been able to be broken to form now an alkene, now this one becomes an additional reaction. Also, so you can see that alkenes, alkenes and alkynes only undertake additional reaction and not substitution reaction. So since this 
hydrocarbon is unsaturated so you can be able to say that since it is unsaturated therefore the above reaction is an additional reaction so you can give those reasons alkenes alkynes and alkenes only undergo additional reactions so this is an additional reaction and also since this hydrocarbon is unsaturated it can only undergo an additional reaction and not a substitution reaction so the reaction is an additional reaction so the next part of question is asking name the product that is formed so we name that product that is formed so you can see that we have two bromines each in each carbon so the first carbon has its own bromine the second carbon has its own bromine so the name given to this compound is therefore one two dibromoethane because we are now from an alkene family to an alkene family. That's why we are saying that the product form is 1, 2, dibromoethane. And that is it. So the next question is asking, we have been told that 3.2 grams of XOH reacts completely with 20 centimeters cubed of 2 molar dilute sulfuric acid. So part of the question is asking, write down the chemical equation for the reaction that is formed in this equation. So I've been told that XOH is reacting with sulfuric acid. That is the first part we, we, uh, whereby we should begin with. And remember, there is no element in periodic table uh, designed as H or having a symbol of H. So it means that this H is just an arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary letter to represent another um, element which is supposed to be here. But we have been told that XOH is reacting with sulfuric acid. Since we can see that this is an OH, it tells us that this is a base. Sulfuric acid is an acid. So what happens when an acid reacts with a base? We're going to get salt plus water only. So if you can look at this equation, we have now the XOH reacting with sulfuric acid, and then we are going to get a salt, which is X2, then SO4, and then plus H2O. But why did we write X2SO4? Why not just XSO4? So, we had to know the valency of this X. How did we realize the valency of X? If you can look at the first information which we have been given, we have been told that we have an XOH. We don't know what is X, but we know what is an OH. An OH, this is a radical. This radical has a valency of 1. So, since this radical has a valency of 1, if you look at the formula which was formed when this OH reacted with X, we have 1 of the OH, uh, below the X and then we have also one of the X below the OH. Remember for us to form the products, the valencies interchange. So this means that the valency of the OH is below the X which is 1. We don't show 1. And also the valency of the X is 1 which is not below the OH. So since we don't show 1, this will mean that the valency of X is 1. Uh, being that the valency of OH is also 1. So having known that the valency of X is 1, therefore it was easy for us now to know the product which could have been formed when now the sulfate reacted with the X. And that's why for the product now we have X2SO4. So for this 2 under the X, X2SO4, that 2 is now the valency of the sulfate because a sulfate radical has a valency of 2 having a charge of negative. That's why for the product it is X2SO4 and then plus water. Why did you say plus water? It's because XOH is a base. H2SO4 sulfuric acid is an acid. So what happens when a base reacts with an acid? We get salt, which in this case is X2SO4 and then plus water molecules. If you balance this equation, you are going to put 2 in front of XOH and then in front of sulfuric acid we have 1, X2SO4 we have 1 and the rest of water we also have 1 there. So. In this case now, uh, we have now balanced the equation. After balancing the equation, let's now go to question letter B. So question letter B is asking, calculate the relative atomic mass of the formula of XOH. So what is the relative atomic mass of the formula of XOH? I guess this question should be asking about the relative molecular mass. So calculate the relative molecular mass of the formula of XOH. So where did we begin or where do we begin? So the place where we begin in this question, we look at the question, what we have been asked, we get, a form, uh, we get information there. After getting information in the question, we now know which formula specific to apply in now beginning to answer our question. 
So in this case, you can see that the first bit of information we have been given in this question is that we have been given details of sulfuric acid. We have been told that the sulfuric acid uh, was of two molarity, and apart from that, it was only 20 centimeters cubed of sulfuric acid that was reacted in this case. So since this was so, so we are going now to apply now the formula for calculating the moles of sulfuric acid. Because remember, if we know the moles of sulfuric acid, it will now be easy for us to know the moles of the XOH that are reacted. If we know the moles of XOH that are reacted, we're going to use these moles of XOH, uh, like together with its mass, which we have been given is 3.2 grams. So moles plus mass now to get the relative atomic mass or the relative molecular mass of this compound. So everything begins from sulfuric acid. So in sulfuric acid, remember, we've been told that we have 20 centimeters cubed of sulfuric acid, which was of two molarity. So the formula we're going to apply here, we're going to say that moles is equals to volume. Uh, so moles is equals to volume times molarity <clears throat> divided by a thousand centimeters cubed. So that is the formula which you are going to apply. So if you apply everything to this formula, so we're going to get that the moles of sulfuric acid that reacted in this experiment or the 20 centimeters cubed or the moles which were in 20 centimeters cubed were only 0 0.04 moles. Now, these are the moles of sulfuric acid that were in 20 centimeters cubed that reacted in this case. Those are the moles of sulfuric acid. So, looking at the equation that we had written in A. So, for this equation, remember we had also identified the mole ratio. We had balanced the equation. So, from balancing the equation, that is now where you can get the mole ratio. So, in this equation, we had gotten the mole ratio, whereby the mole ratio was 2 is to 1, then the arrow, it was 1, 1. So in this case, we see that 1 mole of sulfuric acid represents 0 0.04 moles. So that is from the balancing. 1 represents 0 0.04. So what about 2 for the XOH? So what about 2? So for the XOH, we are going to see that if 1 of sulfuric acid is going to be 0 0.04 moles, therefore, 2 for XOH is going to be 0 0.08 moles. So those are the moles of the XOH that had reacted in this experiment. It was 0 0.08 moles. So now to get the, or to now answer the question, we calculate the relative molecular mass of the XOH that had been formed in this experiment. So uh, like what you are going to do, you are going to say that, so we're going to apply the formula. So remember the basic formula, it's uh, moles is equals to mass divided by the relative atomic mass. That's the basic formula. So for this, uh, like in this case, we are being asked to calculate now the relative molecular mass. So if you calculate the relative molecular mass in this case, so we're going to apply the formula. And when you apply the formula, so we are going to get that the mass of now the XOH is going to be 40 grams. So that is now going to be 40 grams. That is for the whole formula, which is the XOH. So for you to get only the mass of X, only the mass of X. So I'm going to say, if the mass of XOH is equals to 40 grams, what about now the mass of X only? So to get the mass of X only, it is simple. So you know the mass of oxygen, which is 16. We know the mass of hydrogen, which is 1. So I'm going to say that this X plus 16 for oxygen plus 1 for hydrogen is equals to 40 grams. So what is the mass of only X? So I'm going to say that if now 17, if now we take 16 of oxygen plus 1, plus 1 for hydrogen, we're going to get 17. So if you subtract this 17, we are now going to get the mass of X, which is 23 grams. And that is the mass of only the X in this case. So only the X is 23 grams. But if you have been asked the mass of the compound which X was, it was 40 grams. So the other question you can be asked, you can be asked to now identify element X. If you have been asked to identify element X, you are going to say that this element X is sodium because it is only sodium in the periodic table which has a mass of 23 grams. Therefore, if X is equal to sodium, now the compound which, is, which was unknown, the compound XOH, which was unknown, therefore should be sodium hydroxide. Because if you add the mass of sodium hydroxide, you're going to get 40 grams.